thank you uh, to the organizers for the invitation to um, speak to you on the subject here this morning. Um, I'm starting here on this slide with uh, an image, it's actually a photo, um, uh, artistic rendition of the Greek goddess Nyx. And um, this is a little bit of a teaser. Um, Nyx is going to come back and play a role in the story I'm gonna tell you today, um, later in the talk. So this is just to um, you know, tell you to keep your ears open for, for when she comes back and um, we see what she has to tell us about uh, possibly dark matter. Um, the focus of my talk today is going to be on how we can create a map of the dark matter distribution near the sun. And by the distribution here, I mean both the velocity distribution as well as the density distribution. The ultimate motivation for this, um, at least for me, is uh, direct detection experiments uh, where we're trying to find and discover dark matter through its interactions with terrestrial targets. So if a dark matter particle comes in, hits a nucleus in the detector, causes the nucleus to scatter, um, and then based off of that scattering event, we can infer the presence of a, a dark matter particle that created that collision. Um, but in order to uh, understand uh, the rate for which these interactions occur uh, in the terrestrial experiment, we need to be able to have an accurate phase space map for the local dark matter halo, which includes both its local number density as well as its velocity distribution. Now, for the past few decades, um, there's been a, one primary model that has been used in the community. This was the first model that was posited back in the uh, 1980s, uh, pretty soon after the discovery of flat rotation curves. Um, and the way the model um, is built up is by assuming that the dark matter acts as a collisionless fluid with some phase space distribution that we'll label F. And then we assume that the fluid mass is conserved. And we layer onto that several additional assumptions, for example, that the dark matter is in steady state, that its velocities are isotropic, and that the rotation curve is flat, because we wanted to be able to reproduce the, um, the observations. And when you take all of these uh, assumptions together, what you end up um, with at the end of the day is a prediction that the density distribution, uh, number density distribution goes as one over R squared for the dark matter and that its velocity distribution is Maxwell Boltzmann. Um, and so this is what's known as the standard halo model. Whenever you see any result from a direct detection experiments, any limit curve or projection, it almost certainly assumes the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Um, what I want to do today is to revisit this model, um, in particular the assumptions that are fed into it, in light of new data coming from the Gaia satellite, and see how that data informs um, sort of the next generation iteration of this, uh, of this model. So in particular, let's focus on uh, the steady state assumption and ask what exactly does that mean for dark matter in a galaxy like the Milky Way? Um, the way I like to think about it is uh, in terms of the Milky Way's history and its family's tree in terms of how it evolved to where it is today. In the lambda cold dark matter paradigm, galaxies like our own grow through the mergers of smaller galaxies. Um, and in the case where we have, for example, a very quiet merger history, um, as illustrated schematically here, at very early time, you might have had some merger. Um, and then after those two galaxies collided, the system would have had plenty of time to just kind of sit there and come into equilibrium leading to the galaxy that we see today. And we can contrast this with a much more active merger history. Uh, so one where over the period of same period of time, you would have had multiple mergers. And in this kind of scenario, um, the galaxy, the dark matter in the galaxy would not have had enough time to equilibrate and reach steady state by today. Um, so the, the example on the left, the quiet merger history case, would be a scenario where the standard halo model would be expected to apply because the steady state hypothesis would be preserved, but the case on the right um, would violate that assumption. And so the question that we have before us then is what actually is the merger history of the Milky Way? Um, do we fall on the left or the right, somewhere in between? And, um, and then how, what are the ensuing implications for um, our modeling of the phase space distribution for the dark matter? 
Um, so my talk is going to be divided into two parts. The first part, I'm going to focus on building um, a, a theoretical understanding of how, um, well, first, the process of galactic cannibalism, um, by which galaxies like the Milky Way grow, and what happens to the dark matter in this process. Um, so how we understand um, the structures that remain in the dark matter distribution. Uh, and then the second part of the talk, um, we're going to build on this the theory foundation. I'm going to start looking at data from the Gaia satellite and, and interpret some of the um, recent discoveries there um, in terms of the local dark matter distribution. So let me start by just showing you uh, a, a brief video um, of simulation of a lambda cold dark matter uh, scenario. Um, the video that I'm going to show you is um, just of the stars in the simulation. So starting at some very early redshift, like Z equals 10, and then evolving all the way up until the present day. And the video of uh, this little video movie um, zooms in on a single galaxy in, in the simulation. And this galaxy turns out to have um, mass and uh, properties that are very similar to the Milky Way today. Um, keep in mind that the same simulation also keeps track of all of the dark matter particles, um, but that is not actually shown in the video. So at these early times, you see that there are these very significant violent mergers that are um, creating ultimately a stellar disk, which you can start seeing to form right around now. And the mergers continue even at this later point in time, but they're um, in some sense less dramatic. Um, let me just run that through again. So here's the, the first part where the mergers are very violent. Um, the system and the potential energy of the system is reconfiguring itself a lot during each one of these collisions. And then here later on, you can still see the collisions occurring, um, but they're less destructive, so to say, speak. So what I want to do now is essentially break down this evolution um, very systematically. So let's start with this initial stage where we have some satellite galaxy that's falling into the Milky Way. Um, as that satellite galaxy falls in, tidal forces from our own galaxy are going to be stripping away the dark matter and stars from that satellite galaxy. Um, and the material that gets stripped away, both the dark matter and the stars, um, essentially just kind of litter our own galaxy. Um, and in the beginning, that um, material, that tidal debris, um, very roughly ends up just tracing out the path that's taken by the satellite galaxy as it falls in. Um, and this forms um, in these initial stages what are called tidal streams. We see evidence for stellar tidal streams in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, perhaps one of the more spectacular um, examples is the Sagittarius stream, which I'm going to show you a little simulation of here. So Sagittarius is a dwarf galaxy that is in the process of being disrupted as it's Milky Way. So we actually see the, it's not completely disrupted. We still see it um, there. But we also can see these um, tidal streams that have formed as it's been falling in. Um, now, if you know, we evolve time, <laughs> continue forwards in time, Sagittarius is ultimately going to be completely disrupted. Um, but what we have here and actually where this movie is ending is essentially the snapshot of where we are today. So the um, Sagittarius dwarf is kind of this little blob right down here. Um, what my collaborators and I have done is we've gone into um, the simulation that the movie I showed you in the beginning. So that's coming from the FIRE simulation. Um, FIRE here stands for Feedback in Realistic Environments. Um, these simulations have been created by um, a collaboration led by Phil Hopkins at Caltech. Um, they include gas physics, um, stellar physics, as well as dark matter physics. And so we can go into these simulations and find examples of um, the kinds of remnants that get left behind when these mergers happen, and then study carefully what happens to the dark matter and stars um, in that material that gets left behind. So this is one example where we went into one of these galaxies and we found um, an example stellar stream. And then we looked to see what happened to the dark matter and the stars in the stream that was left behind. Um, what I'm showing here in this um, plot on the left is the speed distribution of the stars in pink and the dark matter in purple, uh, sorry, in blue. And um, what you can see is that the speed distributions are pretty close to each other. They're not exactly matching. This is generally what we find with streams. You get 
um, a close but not perfect correspondence between the dark matter and the stars that are left behind from the same merger. Um, I should also say that all of the comments that I'm making here about the conclusions that I'm drawing from the simulations um, apply to A, simulations that are cold dark matter. Um, so the conclusions may be different if you change the dark matter physics. And second, um, my statements are specific to the um, dark matter and stellar distribution in the vicinity of the sun. So they do not, do not necessarily apply um, broadly um, over the entire galaxy, but um, what we're studying is really just a very local region around where the sun would be expected to be in the simulation box. All right, so let's now evolve this a little bit further. So the satellite galaxy falls in, but now it sort of has had some time to evolve. So it's made several loops and orbits around the center of the Milky Way. Um, and so the material, material is continuously getting dumped, um, but you can think of this as sort of like winding up a big like ball of yarn. Um, with each new orbital loop, you end up losing information about the spatial distribution of the material that gets left behind. Um, so you're kind of just left with this cloud of stuff. Um, what's interesting though, is that even though the spatial information gets wiped out, the velocity information um, is still interesting. And so you're still left with some velocity substructure um, in, in the material that's left behind. This is referred to as debris flow. Um, so here's an example from the fire simulation where we find a galaxy that came in a little bit um, uh, earlier. Um, where it's made several orbits um, and uh, is not fully disrupted yet. Um, and with this not so recent merger example, we can again look at the stars in pink and the dark matter in blue. And what I'm showing you here is the radial velocity distribution of the material. And there's two distinctive features. Um, the first is that the dark matter and the stars actually correspond to each other very nicely. Um, the, the, and secondly, that the, the, both of their distributions um, have this kind of interesting bimodal shape to it. And it turns out that this bimodality that you see in the radial velocity distribution is uh, very distinctive of galaxy, of material that's left behind by galaxies that are coming in on very radial orbits. Um, it's also an indication that the um, material has not had time to equilibrate. If it did have time to equilibrate and come into steady state, um, these distributions would be expected to be just simple Gaussians centered at zero. And the last um, case that I want to consider is the one of the oldest mergers that come into um, the galaxy. Um, in these cases, um, you know, the material comes in very early on um, and all of it has time to equilibrate. Um, and so if we look at the material that's dumped into a Milky Way-like galaxy by some of the oldest mergers in fire, what we find is that um, here looking on the left at the radial velocity distribution, the dark matter and the stars, A, track each other um, almost exactly, and B, um, uh, just follow a, a sort of simple Gaussian distribution. And actually this pertains to all different velocity components here. In each velocity direction, we, we're getting that sort of expected Gaussian behavior. This is just essentially the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Um, but what's really interesting is that in each of these cases, the, um, the dark matter and the stellar distributions actually line up um, pretty spot on. So to recap, our philosophy here to try to um, empirically determine what the local dark matter distribution um, is very bottom up. So what we're seeking to do here is to say that, okay, the dark matter that's near the sun is coming, is being sourced by these satellite galaxies that merged with the Milky Way. Um, during the Milky Way's evolution. Um, we can divide up those galaxies in terms of a subset that has stars, so we'll call those the luminous satellite galaxies, and the ones that do not have stars. Um, everything I've told you so far pertains to the luminous satellite galaxies. Um, and in that category, we can divide that further by considering some of the oldest mergers, then some not so recent mergers, and then also the recent mergers. Each of these three categories leaves distinctive kinds of um, substructure in spatial or velocity space. So for example, the recent mergers will leave um, spatial and velocity substructure. The not so recent mergers leave only velocity substructure. And then the old mergers don't leave any substructure whatsoever. Um, but if we can reconstruct these three separate pieces, then we can build up the dark matter that comes from the luminous satellite galaxies. 
Um, then the next task after that is to figure out how to handle the dark matter that comes from the non-luminous satellite galaxies. But for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on the left part here of this diagram. This is where we've been, um, we've been able to make the most progress over the last few years, primarily because of um, data that's coming from the Gaia satellite. So that's what I want to move on to next. Um, so the Gaia mission is the follow-up astrometric survey to the Hipparchos mission, which um, flew 1989 to 1993. It was launched in December 2013. Um, everything I'm going to show you is going to be based off of the second data release, which um, uh, was announced in April 2018. Uh, the third data release is coming um, shortly, the end of this year as well as next year. Uh, what's exciting about Gaia is that it provides measurements for over a billion stars in the galaxy. Um, by measurements here, I mean the full 60 phase space coordinates for every star, so three position coordinates, three velocity coordinates. Um, at the moment, um, we do not have that 60 information for all of the billion stars, but that's the ultimate goal for the end of the mission. Um, this is way more phase space information for the stars than we've ever had. Um, it will ultimately end up constituting about 1% of the Milky Way stars. So what our goal is um, in, when reconstructing the dark matter distribution from the stellar data is we start from the Gaia map, which is shown here on the upper left, based off of information on the stellar position, its velocity, and um, sometimes it, we also use its chemical abundances, then we can infer something about whether or not those stars came from some galaxy at emerged with the Milky Way at some earlier point in time. And then based off of um, what we're inferring about the properties of that galaxy, we can do some dedicated simulations to figure out where the associated dark matter would also be from such a merger. Um, so I'm going to tell you about two different approaches that we've taken to date. Um, the first one um, I sometimes call it like a human centric approach. It's one where we impose um, restrictions on the data, tight restrictions on the data to minimize contamination from what would be background in these cases. Um, the second approach, which I'll tell you about shortly, um, is utilizing machine learning uh, methods to try to tackle these challenges. Um, and I want to credit uh, Lena Nasib, who's a postdoc now at Carnegie. Um, for uh, her contributions on, on this, this first part of the work. Okay, so what we want to do here is essentially select out those stars that we think are most likely to be coming from these mergers. And these are really just a very tiny fraction of the stars that are in the Milky Way. Um, so just to emphasize, this is literally like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, most of the stars in the Gaia data are stars that are associated with the Milky Way's disk. Um, and those are not the stars that we're interested in here. We're interested in the ones that were sort of dragged in from these satellite mergers. Um, so as a first step, and to be very conservative, what we've done is to only look at regions of the sky that are far away, <laughs> we're trying to essentially cut out the disk. So um, we, we do not look at anything uh, within 2.5 kiloparsecs of the sun, and we're only looking at these two slices above and below where the sun is. Um, let me briefly kind of walk you through how we do these kinds of analyses. So in that region of interest, we have a collection of stars and we can plot them um, in different uh, you know, spaces. One particularly enlightening space is to look at different velocity coordinates. So maybe like the rotational velocity of the star, um, its chemical abundance, which is essentially a proxy for age where um, older stars would fall down here, younger stars would fall up here and also their spatial um, distribution in the galaxy. And the stars that we um, expect from the mergers would fall in particular regions of this plane, um, in contrast to the stars that we expect from the Milky Way's disk. Um, and then by applying clustering algorithms, we can try to separate these two distributions um, to just pick out the stars that we think have a high probability of coming from these mergers. This is what the data looks like out of the box. Um, which I thought I'd show in case you've never seen this before. Um, on the, again, this is plotting on the left chemical abundance with older stars down on the bottom of the y-axis and younger stars on the top of the y-axis. And these are the different um, velocity planes. And by eye, this doesn't really look like there's a lot of structures that are there, which is why we need to do um, a full a likelihood Bayesian likelihood analysis 
to, um, to cluster the data into to different contributions. When we do that, uh, what we find evidence for is three different contributions. Um, the green here are the stars that are part of the Milky Way's disk. That's the, in some sense, our background here. That's the contribution we're least interested in for our purposes. Um, the pink are the stars that are coming, we think, from the oldest mergers. Um, they're the oldest stars, as indicated by the fact that they're lowest on the y-axis. Um, they're also roughly isotropic at each of the velocity coordinates. And then the blue are the substructure. Um, so these are stars that we think are coming from a not so old merger. Um, it's uh, it, pretty distinctive in the left panel here. You see that it looks kind of like a squashed ellipse in the radial, its radial velocity. Um, and that's indicative that, um, that there's uh, some, some velocity substructure that's there. So it turns out that that substructure is associated with a merger that has come to be called Gaia and Saladas, which was first posited by Vasily Belopurov and Amina Helmi in 2018. Um, and it's thought that that merger dragged in the majority of the local stars in the center of the Milky Way. So that's what this movie here is showing. The red is star, are the stars associated with this Gaia and Saladas merger. And um, here you're seeing where those stars ended up at the end of the merger that occurred. What this result essentially allows us to do is to come back to this family tree here and pin down um, one of our most recent relatives. So we now believe that Gaia and Saladis uh, is one of our most significant relatives in terms of um, mergers that contributed to stuff that's near where the solar position is in the Milky Way. Um, Gaia and Saladis uh, merged with our galaxy about 7 billion years ago. Um, and uh, um, its stellar mass at the time was roughly 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th solar masses. Um, so what, based off of our work with simulation data, what we can then do is take the information that we're getting from Gaia um, from the stellar distributions, where we see that about 40% of the local stars are associated with this, um, the oldest mergers, so we're calling this the halo piece, and 60% are associated with Enceladus. Um, and then what we can do is infer from that what the corresponding dark matter um, should be from the same um, uh, sources. So um, the corresponding distributions would be about 60% of the local dark matters in this halo component and about 40% is associated with Gaia and Saladis, this substructure piece. And um, you might notice that these numbers switched from 40 to 60%. Um, that's not a typo, that's intentional. There's actually a lot of work that goes into determining what these fractions are. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss that afterwards if there's any questions. Um, but that's one of the things where we've been able to make a lot of progress. So in these fractions that we get in terms of the components that are in the halo versus the substructure, we actually can get, we have error bars on those numbers and we know exactly what's feeding into those error bars. Okay, so um, this takes us now to just our last piece here. So. Um, we're starting to fill in this in here. So we're from the Gaia data, we are finding evidence for old mergers that contributed to the dark matter, as well as um, a uh, fairly recent uh, relative, Gaia and Saladis. Um, and now we're just going to go in and see if we can find anything else. So this last piece of the talk, um, I just want to tell you about um, work that was led by Lena Naseeb and Brian Ostiak, who's a postdoc at Harvard. Um, where we were letting the machine determine um, whether a star is from a merger or from a disk. Um, and this approach allows us now to get in close to where the sun is, which is ultimately where we want to be able to probe things if we're, um, you know, for direct detection experiments. The challenge here is that only 1% of the stars in this region originate from galaxy mergers, so it becomes really hard to um, pick out the, the signal, our signal here, versus our background, which is what's dominating. So we're going to let the machine do this. And the only reason we have any possibility of success here is the fact that um, we have some really great mock catalogs that have been created uh, for Milky Way galaxies. So these mock catalogs are based off of uh, simulations of galaxies like our own. I'm showing an example here at the top from the Ananka mock catalog. And you can compare it by eye to the data on the bottom. You can see that a lot of the structures are reproduced. 
Um, the correspondence is not perfect, but um, it's very good. And it allows us then to uh, train the network on the simulated data, and then to ultimately apply that network to um, the Milky Way galaxy. So in this process, the network learns to distinguish disk stars from Milky Way, um, from merger stars in the simulated galaxy, and then applies that knowledge to um, the Milky Way galaxy, the actual Gaia data. Um, this is an extremely brief uh, summary of what we've done. Um, it summarizes two years worth of extensive testing that we performed uh, to make sure that the neural network was learning something reasonable from being trained on these simulations. Um, I'm going to skip that uh, given the time, um, but I'm also happy to discuss that further. Um, what we ultimately find after when looking at the output of the neural network um, is the following. So that's summarized in this plot here. So this is showing um, the velocity distribution of all of the stars that the network thinks with very high probability originated from mergers um, near the solar position. So again, we see um, this pink circle region. Those are the stars that we think are associated with the oldest mergers. Um, we see evidence for Gaia and Saladis. That's the cyan curve here. Um, and in addition, we see evidence for something new. So that's Nyx, um, the Greek goddess of the night, which I started off with. Um, and Nyx here appears to be um, a really massive and extensive stellar stream um, near the solar position. Um, so this is just an image of the velocities of each of the Nyx stars. There's about um, 200, of, 200 of them uh, relative to the sun. You can see that the velocities are all quite coherent. Um, and additionally, uh, the Nyx stars, they are kind of rotating with the disk, but their orbits are much more eccentric than the disk orbits. So there's still a lot of work to be done to confirm the origin of the Nyx stream. Um, the kinematics of the Nyx suggest that it is a remnant of a galaxy merger, but with further um, spectroscopic studies, we'll be able to confirm this hypothesis. And in particular, um, what we really want to be able to confirm is that Nyx is distinct from, um, its origin is distinct from the origin of the disk stars. Um, so this is uh, ongoing work. And actually, much of this data was collected over the summer um, and is currently being analyzed. So we'll, we'll have um, better information on that very soon. Um, and the reason that um, I'm quite excited about Nix is that if it did originate from a galaxy merger, um, that kind of merger typically leads to a co-rotating dark matter disk. So this would be a significant edit to our uh, modeling of the dark matter distribution in the Milky Way. Um, you can think of this disk as being, the dark matter disk as being this big puffy disk that's kind of enveloping the Milky Way's um, stellar component here and is, is rotating um, sort of with the, the disk, but a bit slower. So it kind of lags behind the disk motion. Um, and I have an undergrad, um, Ben Dodge, who is currently running some dedicated simulations to understand how the dark matter from these kinds of mergers um, forms these dark, these disks and um, whether or not the stars that also come from the, the mergers end up reproducing um, uh, behavior that looks like the next stream. Okay, so um, that takes me to the end of my presentation. Um, we've made a lot of progress um, with the Gaia data in, in understanding the dark matter distribution that's coming from these luminous satellite galaxies. Um, near the solar position, we certainly see evidence for um, a, what we'll call the old halo. So that's dark matter that came in from the oldest mergers in the Milky Way. We also um, see evidence for uh, um, material that was dumped from um, Gaia and Saladis, so a significant merger that came in about 7 billion years ago. And we um, believe that there is dark matter substructure that's also associated with Gaia and Saladis. And um, we're currently, um, we, we certainly see evidence for a stream, a large stream um, called Nix. Um, we are currently doing follow-up spectroscopic studies to understand whether or not that Nix stream did indeed come from a galaxy merger. If it did, then um, it too would um, have left behind some dark matter, potentially in the form of a dark matter disk. Um, so this is ongoing work trying to further characterize the implications of the Nix stream. Um, now, oops, 
uh, we still have work to do in terms of capturing and modeling the dark matter that would have come from the non-luminous satellite galaxies. This is still open territory. Um, we have ideas for how to do this. Um, really, once we understand the left part of this diagram here, that will give us some leverage and an ability to then infer something about the fraction of the local dark matter that would have been coming from the non-luminous satellite galaxies. So I think there is a path forward there. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a question that we, we have yet to, to still tackle and address. Um, so I will conclude there and I'm happy to take any questions.